Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be able to meet with you during this virtual conference of the Florida State Music Teachers Association. We're talking about breaking barriers at this conference. We usually think of sleep and exercise as wellness strategies, and they certainly are. But I wanna move beyond that concept and speak about sleep and exercise as practice strategies that lead to more solid memory and thus greater confidence as we perform, and that leads to better health outcomes. If you go to my uh, blog site, themusiciansbrain.com, in the menu, go to links, scroll down to FSMTA Wellness, there will be an online handout um, concerning this session with links to all of the research mentioned in this talk, as well as links to videos, books, and other material of interest. We speak with our students about the importance of both sleep and exercise, but to most students and to us as well, that extra practice time seems more important than either sleep or exercise. But think about it. If you were facing surgery, how would you feel if you knew the surgeon had had only four hours of sleep the previous night? Would you feel that she was at her best to perform surgery, to remember every aspect of the procedure, to be able to handle any complications that arose? Probably not. But our students, and sometimes we, think that we can perform with little sleep and still have our brains functioning well during the performance. And exercise? Many of us and our students exercise because it makes us feel good and we know that it's good for physical health. But both sleep and exercise have been shown to be important for encoding and consolidation of memory, which of course is what we rely on when we perform. So let's begin with sleep. Way back when I was a college senior, this photo might have been me. Even though I wanted to get a performance degree, I was strongly urged to get a music education degree as well. So I was doing a double degree, working very hard on my senior recital, stressed while waiting to hear from graduate schools, student teaching in both elementary and high school, and teaching piano in the preparatory department every afternoon when I returned from student teaching. I was exhausted, and the only time I had to practice was at night. One night in the practice room, I put my head down on the keyboard for just a few minutes that, to just rest a little bit. The practice rooms all had small windows on them, and all of a sudden outside the room, I heard a couple of guys talking. One said, what do you think she's doing? And his friend replied, must be a new way of memorizing. I went home and told my roommates about it, and we laughed, thinking that the idea of sleeping to help memory was pretty funny. But that student was on to something, even if he or I didn't know it. Matthew Walker is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley, and he's a leading researcher on sleep and the author of Why We Sleep. He has said that given the multiple kinds of memory, the number of stages in memory, and the several stages of sleep, one is faced with a truly staggering number of possible ways that sleep might affect memory consolidation. I'm going to add a fourth given because all of Walker's givens have to do with the brain. So we need to add a given concerning the number of brain areas involved in music and memory. And we'll look at all four of these to see how sleep affects memory for music. I'm a fan of British mysteries on television and various streaming services. And if any of you watch these British mysteries, you'll be familiar with the openings of many dramas in which they tend to flash quickly past multiple disparate scenes and you have no idea how they're all at some point going to fit together. But as the story unfolds, they do. So this talk is somewhat like that. We have to go through all of these 
givens of walkers plus my own before we'll see how they fit together, explaining why sleep is so important for musical memory. So please bear with me as we move along. We're going to begin with the fourth given, the number of brain areas involved in making music. We used to hear that language was processed in the left hemisphere and music in the right, but that is not the case. Areas throughout the entire brain are involved in making music. If you look at the top image to the left, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for thinking, planning, working memory, paying attention. Moving to the right, um, the premotor and supplementary motor areas are responsible for planning, preparation, and guidance of movement, and the motor cortex actually puts those movements into play. The somatosensory cortex has to do with sensory information and touch. The superior parietal lobe translates the spatial information from a score because we have both time and pitch space in a score, uh, translates that info into complicated motor commands. The visual cortex, of course, has to do with vision. The auditory cortex has to do with hearing. The cerebellum coordinates motor activity, and it's involved in timing and accuracy of movement. Now, if you look at the bottom slide, the brain, as you know, is divided into two hemispheres, left and right. Each hemisphere controls movement on the opposite side of the body. So the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. The left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. The corpus callosum is a mass of nerve fibers that transmits info between the two hemispheres. And since most instruments are played with two hands. There's a lot of information that has to go back and forth between the two hemispheres. Uh, the corpus callosum has actually been found to be larger in people who started studying music early, about the age of five. The basal ganglia right there in the middle is responsible for the automation of skilled movements and for storing movement programs. It's very important in procedural memory, as we'll find out. The hippocampus is responsible for consolidating short-term memory into long-term memory. It's not the only memory area, but we'll come back to that. The amygdala, of course, processes emotion, and we talked about the cerebellum earlier, coordinates motor activity. All of these areas have to connect as we learn to play a piece of music, and they have to connect when we're playing or singing from memory. And we'll also come back to that later. So now let's look at Matthew Walker's first given, the multiple kinds of memory. As you can see in this chart, we, we don't have time to go through all of these in detail, but there is a chapter in my new book, which I'll talk to you about later. But if you look at the top of the chart, all information enters the brain through our sensors, sensory memory, vision, hearing, touch, taste, smell, and proprioception, which is our sense of where our body is in space. Whatever you have paid attention to, sensory memory immediately sends to short-term memory. If you don't see it, it doesn't go to short-term memory. If you don't hear it, it doesn't, or if you're not paying attention to a sound, it doesn't go to short-term memory. Short-term memory, as you know, doesn't last unless we commit it to long-term memory. And there are two kinds of long-term memory. Explicit, which is conscious memory. Implicit, which is unconscious. Explicit is often called declarative. Implicit is called non-declarative, sometimes procedural, which is one of the kinds of implicit memory. The two that we are most concerned about 
other than sensory memory, which is taking everything into the brain. Procedural memory is implicit memory. It's motor skill memory, memory for how to play an instrument, how to play a particular piece of music, tie your shoes, drive a car. Once you learn these things, you do not forget. You don't learn how to play your instrument. I mean, you don't forget how to play your instrument. Declarative memory is specific memory for facts and details. It's information you can verbalize. It's memory for a piece of music. Um, the details about the piece, naming chords, key signature, key changes, etc. Declarative memory is what we lose when we have a memory slip. We don't forget how to play our instrument. Procedural memory is intact. Declarative memory is what we forget when we have a memory slip. So here's where the different brain areas come in. Procedural memory is stored in the basal ganglia, which automated and stored movement programs. Amygdala processes and stores emotion, and the cerebellum, which is coordinating motor activity. Declarative memory is stored in multiple areas of the brain. The hippocampus actually consolidates long-term declarative memory, but then it sends the individual components back to the brain areas where they were first processed. So uh, visual information goes back to the visual cortex to be stored. Auditory information goes back to the auditory cortex to be stored. So you can see that many different parts of the brain are involved in memory for music. Okay, now let's look at Matthew Walker's second given, the number of stages in memory. We're able to learn music, foreign languages, steps in cooking, how to drive a car, um, due to our brain's ability to encode, consolidate, store, retrieve, and reconsolidate information. You often see just three steps, encode, store, retrieve, but that leaves out consolidation, which in my mind is the most important. We can't retrieve something if we haven't consolidated it. We're going to find out that sleep and exercise are incredibly important for encoding, consolidating, and retrieval. So we're going to look at these in a particular piece of music, and I just picked Clementi's Opus 36, number three, Sonatina, C major, which you all know. So encoding is the first step. If information isn't encoded, it can't be consolidated or stored. So as we encounter a new piece of music, we, we, we visually see the notation, we notice the patterns in the right hand or the scalar passages, sorry, the patterns in the left hand, the, the scalar passages in the right. We hear in our mind, or we should hear in our mind, what it sounds like. We feel kinesthetically what it's like to play the notes. We notice tempo indications, dynamics, etc. All of that information enters the brain through our senses, sensory memory. Sound waves are turned into electrical impulses in the inner ear, light waves into electrical impulses in the eye, touch sensations turned into electrical impulses before they enter the brain. And then these neural impulses travel from one brain neuron to the next, to connect all the various parts of the brain we just saw were involved in making music. All the neural connections form a representation of the piece. Some researchers call these representations memory traces, other call, some call them memory traces, some call them neural pathways. But the initial sight reading is creating just a temporary trace or pathway in the brain. If you don't come back to work on the piece, those memory traces will be lost. 
if we want to actually learn the piece, we begin to practice. And that's where consolidation begins. As we practice, we fix wrong notes or rhythms. We figure out fingerings. We work on our technique. We add technique, add info, think of different interpretations, add details, dynamics, etc. We continue to encode new information, but we're also consolidating what's there. And what the brain is doing is reorganizing and stabilizing. It's adding meaning. It's putting it all in context, filling in blanks making connections to what we know previously, maybe another Clementi Sonatina we've learned, maybe a Kulau Sonatina. This is consolidation. But what's happening in the brain, all of these neur neurons connecting to form a neural pathway from one uh, brain area to the other, um, let's look at an individual neuron. There are 86 billion of these in the brain, and the neural impulses enter the cell body through these projections called dendrites. Then it's processed in the cell body. Information goes out the axon, which is a single strand. The axon and uh, ends in several endings called axon terminals. And as the electrical impulse gets to the end, it causes a chemical, a neurotransmitter, to be released across that gap that's called the synapse. And then on the other side of the gap, another neuron information again becomes electrical impulses, goes through the whole process. And so you get these chains of neurons that form pathways and entire networks. So biologically, what's happening as we practice, more neurons are being added to the network as we add more information. Um, as the pathway continues to be used, the synapses become stronger. Transmission becomes faster because myelin is added to the axon. Myelin is like insulation. It um, protects the axon and it makes uh, conduction faster. And in a Swedish study of professional pianists, they discovered that these pianists had far more uh, myelin on their axons than the general population because they've practiced so much. Musicians like to say practice makes perfect. But scientists say cells that fire together wire together because the more often the electrical impulse causes chemicals to fire across the synapse to the next neuron, the stronger that synapse becomes. And that's what happens when we practice. That's neuroplasticity, which means the brain is changing. And that is the basis of learning and memory. But practice doesn't actually make perfect, it makes permanent. The brain doesn't autocorrect. When you realize you've made a mistake or someone points it out to you and you wanna fix it, it's not enough to know that it's wrong. There is a biological process you have to go through if you want to rewire because of mistakes or injury or you want to change your technique or whatever it is. The synapses in a particular pathway have to disconnect, and that happens through non-use. And then you create new pathways, rewiring different information. And that's a process that takes time. And it's why under stress, we often resort, or our students often resort, to the initial wrong notes or rhythms because the pathway has not been made strong enough. And we're actually going to see later how sleep is so important to combat stress. 
And I have discovered that when students understand that fixing things is not just a matter of knowing that it's wrong, but it's an actual biological process in the brain, they tend to be more patient. So if you continue to practice and refine, the neural pathways are strengthened and short-term memory is consolidated as long-term memory. Storage. Storage for a piece isn't all in one place. <clears throat> Researchers sometimes use the example of an apple. You think of an apple, the color red is processed in one place in the brain. The fact that it's a fruit is another place. The fact that it's round is another place. Um, the fact that you can use it to make apple pie comes from another place in the brain. And all of this is pulled together when you think Apple. The same thing is true with music. We can't control where memories are stored, but what we can control is what we've paid attention to as we practice. What information and how much information? Are we encoding visual information? Are we encoding auditory kinesthetic information, how much knowledge about the piece are we encoding? All of that is stored in different places, but it's all pulled together when we retrieve a memory, which is when we perform. The neural pathways that were formed when the memory was encoded and consolidated are revisited when we retrieve the memory. And how well we remember depends on the strength of those pathways. The hippocampus has consolidated short-term declarative memory into long-term, but then it sends the components back to the auditory cortex, the visual cortex, the kinesthetic, the somatosensory cortex, back to the areas where they were originally processed. And all of that is pulled together when we play a piece from memory. The act of retrieving a memory actually changes it. Um, just as the act of practicing a piece changes over time, each time we play a piece, the pathways are strengthened, but they're also changed a little bit. Might be slightly different interpretation, better fingering, more fluid technique. So that, those pathways are constantly changing. The memory itself changes and it's reconsolidated and again stored. The following slide is an artist's version of neurons connecting to form vast neural networks. The flashes of light, of course, are the electrical impulses that are traveling uh, from the dendrites into the cell body and then down the axon to another cell. It's rather remarkable to think that the beautiful music we make and listen to in the brain is all electrical impulses and chemicals. It's the mind that actually creates music. So as we have just seen, we have multiple stages of memory but we also have multiple stages of sleep. Matthew Walker's third given the several stages of sleep. We tend to think of practice as synonymous with physical activity. We must be actually playing the instrument. We're familiar with this phrase, let me sleep on it, usually meaning to delay a decision to have time to think about it. But sleeping on it is also necessary to prepare the brain for encoding new material, to consolidate memory more securely, and to ensure access to memory when we're under stress. In the 1920s, researchers found that memory retention was better after a night of sleep than after an equivalent amount of time being awake. And they thought that was because the brain wasn't active and it wasn't receiving any new sensory information. 
it didn't occur to them that the brain might actually be doing something during sleep. But in 1929, a new technology, encephalography or EEG, was developed to record brain activity. And scientists could begin to see that, in fact, during sleep, the brain was very active. It didn't shut off. Then in the 1950s, they discovered REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and non-rapid eye movement sleep and realized that sleep wasn't a single state. While we sleep, our brain cycles through several stages of both REM and non-REM sleep. N1 is the lightest as we're just drifting off. And then it gradually, the waves get slower and deeper through stages N2, N3, and sometimes researchers speak of an N4. N3 or N4 is the deepest sleep, and it's actually called deep or slow wave sleep. REM is when we dream. Sleep spindles, which you can see with N2 here, are bursts of neural activity. They're an EEG hallmark of non-REM sleep, and they're believed to facilitate many sleep-related functions like memory consolidation. We go through several cycles of sleep a night, beginning with N1, then N2, then N3 or 4, as brain waves slow down and sleep becomes deeper. Then back to N2, then REM sleep, and then the whole thing repeats. And we go through several cycles a night, and several stages of sleep are involved in memory. About 75% of sleep is spent in the non-REM stages with the majority of that in N2. So now let's start putting all of this together. Encoding, we said, is the first stage in memory. It depends on our brain's ability to pay attention to detail. If we don't see, hear, or feel it, it won't be encoded. Lack of sleep impairs encoding. Several studies by Sean Drummond, who is at Monash University in Australia, found that sleep deprivation causes the hippocampus, which is important for declarative memory, to not function well. And other areas of the brain try to compensate, areas of the brain having to do with short-term and working memory and they overcompensate. So if areas of the brain that aren't designed for encoding are trying to do the work, the material won't encode well, and then neither can we consolidate it. According to Walker, consolidation begins while we're still practicing, and it continues from a period of just a few minutes up to six hours after practice while we're still awake. The memory is maintained, stabilized at the same level as when practice ended, and it doesn't get any better. It just stays the same. However, memory does improve after a night of sleep. Additional learning takes place without any additional practice. There's evidence that both slow wave sleep and REM sleep are involved in the consolidation of declarative memory, the memory for facts and details about the piece. And stage two, non-REM sleep, is associated with the consolidation of procedural memory, motor skill memory. So all stages of sleep, with the exception of the very earliest stage, are involved in one kind of memory or another. Several studies have shown that motor skills improve in speed and accuracy after a night of sleep. And I must say my favorite is from the University of Texas. Researcher Sarah Allen is now at Southern Methodist, but she worked with Robert Duke at UT Austin and in fact has written several papers with him. Duke has presented at MTNA on multiple occasions. And many of you may know his book, Intelligent Music Teaching. Sarah Allen did a study 
of 60 undergrad and graduate music majors divided into four groups. Uh, these 60 students were all majoring in other instruments, but they had basic piano skills. All 60 learned one or both of two melodies in an evening practice session, and they were monitored for speed and accuracy. Then they went home to sleep. Students who had learned one melody, Melody A, when they came back in the morning, showed over 11% improvement in speed and accuracy without any additional practice. Students who learned both A and B, but reviewed Melody A before going home, also had 11% improvement. Students who learned both melodies A and B uh, showed no improvement in either one. Learning the second one seemed to cancel out the first unless they reviewed A before going home. And then they had the 11% improvement. Students who learned A at night, B in the morning, didn't show any improvement in either. That's an amazing improvement in procedural memory, motor skill memory, just from sleeping, 11%. So both slow wave sleep and REM sleep are involved in the consolidation of declarative memory and stage two non-REM sleep is associated with the consolidation of procedural memory. Okay, now what happens when we add stress? A sleepless night can raise anxiety levels by up to 30%, and that's multiplied after several sleepless nights. Swedish researchers at Uppsala University looked at both procedural and declarative memory under stress. In an evening session, participants in the study learned card pair locations on a computer, this is declarative memory, and a finger tapping sequence, procedural memory. Researchers often speak about um, finger tapping sequences and it means something like, you know, using three, one, four, one, five, two, four, three, five, one, two, four, whatever, the five fingers. Sarah Allen, of course, would call it a melody as we would, um, but researchers call it finger tapping. Half of the participants after these, um, after this evening session slept for eight hours, the other half for four hours. They were then tested on the memory tasks from the previous evening, and they all did pretty well, regardless of the amount of sleep. But then the researchers added stress. I, I, I think in terms of amount of time, really pushing them about time. Procedural memory, the finger tapping, remained fine for everyone. But those who had had four hours of sleep showed significant impairment on declarative memory, remembering the card pair locations. Um, so we don't perform without some degree of stress, some more than others. Um, so if you perform, which is stressful, having not had enough sleep, you aren't going to forget how to play your instrument. That's procedural memory. But you are far more likely to forget the music. So adequate sleep is important for encoding and consolidation of memory and also for having access to memory while under stress. So let's look at the other practice strategy in this talk, exercise. There has been far more research concerning sleep and memory than exercise and memory. Much of the research with exercise and memory has been in the field of sports. What we've seen over the past few years how closely related sports and music are concerning wellness considerations for athletes and musicians. Both Gail Berenson, who set up a musician wellness program at Ohio University, and Linda Cockey, who created one at Salisbury University in Maryland, can speak to musician wellness programs in their respective universities that involved athletic trainers. 
So many of the research studies involve learning lists or pairs of words and then recalling them prior to exercise or after exercise. This is declarative memory, just like our memory for a particular piece of music, because there are lots of facts and details about the music we can talk about, declarative memory. So just as with sleep, exercise both before and after learning seems to help in different ways. One British study showed that 30 minutes of moderate intensity cycling before learning aided short-term memory. Long-term memory was facilitated by exercising after learning. Several studies have shown that children who exercise regularly and have a high aerobic capacity test better on tests of memory and cognitive function than kids who don't exercise. So two Swedish researchers wanted to see if the same were true for young adults. So they looked at 13 studies having to do with exercise and learning in which participants were between 18 and 35 years of age, and the types of exercise included walking, running, or bicycling. They found that while exercise before learning improved in coding, exercise immediately after learning didn't have any kind of favor favorable effect on consolidation at all. And that brings us to another study. And there are links to all of these studies in the online handout. A study in the Netherlands demonstrated that exercise after learning improves memory, but it depends on when you do it. They had 72 participants learn 90 picture location associations over 40 minutes, declarative memory. They were all then given a, a, a baseline recall test and then randomly assigned to one of three groups. First group exercised immediately, and the exercise was 35 minutes of interval training on an exercise bike. Second group exercised four hours later. The third group didn't exercise. They all did similarly well on the baseline test. 40, 48 hours later, they had a second recall test while their brains were being imaged in an MRI. And the imaging results showed different patterns of activity in the three groups in the hippocampus, that area we talked about that was instrumental for consolidating short-term into long-term memory. The group showing the most activity was the group that had exercised four hours after studying. And that was also the group that showed the best recall of the information. The researchers didn't measure this, but they did say that previous research suggests that exercise triggers the release of BDNF, which is a molecule involved in plastic changes or neuroplasticity related to learning and memory. And it also is a molecule, and also dopamine, uh, exercise releases dopamine, which also plays an important role in memory. So sleep and exercise don't just make us feel good. They have an important role in memory encoding and consolidation. These are pretty remarkable results. I have this uh, little chart on the handout. Um, just to recap, both sleep and exercise before learning leads to better encoding. Both sleep and exercise after learning leads to better consolidation of memory, but in the case of exercise, it needs to be four hours after learning. Lack of sleep hinders encoding and it makes declarative memory less reliable under stress. So with that, I want to introduce you to my new book, which will be coming out the 3rd of March published by Oxford, The Musical Brain, What Students, Teachers, and Performers Need to Know. I mentioned earlier that memory is discussed much more completely in the book 
The book also discusses everything from the origins of music to how we wire our brains as we learn, the best practice strategies for strong brain wiring, the cognitive, the cognitive advantages of studying music, and more. And if you are interested, there is information on the online handout giving you a code you can use in ordering from Oxford to receive a discount. Just a reminder, um, the handout's available at themusiciansbrain.com. The musicians Click on links, scroll to FSMTA Wellness. Please feel free to contact me either at my Bucknell EDU um, address or through the website, themusiciansbrain.com. When this video presentation concludes, there will be an online uh, Q&A if you have questions, so I'll look forward to speaking with you. Thank you very much.